My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Um, happy to be with you today, uh, continuing to read um, the Jewish the Jewish writings in the virtual reading group, uh, Jewish writings by Hannah Arendt, edited by uh, Jerome Cohn and Ron H. Feldman. Um, so today, um, uh, we are going to be reading, we've read a, a, a number of smaller essays um, culminating with uh, certainly one of the more um, famous essays that Hannah Arendt has written. Um, I think it's one of her most um, honest, not honest, but a lot of her writing is honest. I mean, I don't mean that. Um, it's it's certainly one of her most personal major essays. Um, uh, um, she wrote it in 1943, published in January 1943 in the journal Menorah. Um, um, and, and the beginning of it uh, is just, it's one of those opening sentences that, you know, to me just rep comes back at so many moments in one's life and makes you think. Uh, it's very simple. It says, in the first place, we don't like to be called refugees. Um, she's writing this as a refugee. So let's just start there. Um, she, I mean, I, I just learned this in reading a new manuscript uh, by Lindsay Stonebridge. I mean, I guess I should have known it, but um, in 1938, following the Nuremberg laws, um, Hannah Arendt, along with the Jews in Germany, were stripped of their citizenship, and her official expulsion was listed in the German Leisch's Professional Gazette in Berlin on the 27th of April, 1938. I didn't know that. Um, and uh, so from then on, she had been already out of Germany for five years, um, living in in, in in Paris, having escaped uh, in, when she was arrested in 1933. Um, but then she was no longer uh, a German citizen. Um, she was stateless for, as it's usually said, 17 years. Um, and and she's writing um, this this essay, and she says, "We don't like being called refugees. Um, why? Right?" Uh, I, for a simple, I think, a reason, she calls it a deadening word. Um, it flattens a person and a people and marks them with loss and with vulnerability. If you lose your home and you lose your language and you lose your friends and you lose your families and you live in camps and you're exposed to the public, and you feel the rupture of your private lives, and you're only one of a mass, the refugee becomes, in some ways, a, pity, a, pity, a pitiful figure. The refugee becomes someone who, who um, uh, you can't have compassion for. You can compa have compassion for an individual, right? But if you are faced with masses of refugees, hands open, seeking refuge, compassion is replaced by pity, if not by terror. I think what Arendt is trying to say when she says we do not like to be called refugees is we don't want to be called by the deadening and demeaning word refugee. We don't want to be seen as people who need to be pitied. Um, the refugee wants to be seen as a newcomer. They want to be seen as a newcomer or an immigrant. Um, and it is a, it's really a weird paradox of our international human rights system that in order to get into a country like the United States today, you need to claim to be a refugee. I mean, this is one of the sort of crazy things going on in, in the world today and in the United States today, right? People who come as immigrants aren't allowed in. 
increasingly. And so the only way to get in is to claim to be a refugee, which means to claim to be someone who has become a mass, someone who is pitiful instead of one you can feel compassion for. The refugee today is granted rights that the migrant or exile is not. Um, and that is uh, and something we really do have to um, address and, and understand. Um, in addition, in seeking refuge, the refugee is taught to believe or at least to claim that their life is the highest good. She writes that we refugees brought up in the conviction that life is the highest good and death the greatest dismay. We became witness and victims of worse terrors than death without having been able to discover a higher ideal than life. And so um, the refugee has to sort of claim, I just want to be kept alive, whether that's in a camp or or not. Um, and this dehumanizing reduction of the refugee to a living being seeking refuge endangers the refugee, where death increasingly appears as a seduction, a freedom from the pain and trouble of a meaningless life. Which is why Arendt writes that as time went on, we got worse, even more optimistic, and even more inclined to suicide. Uh, and then there's this just, I mean, again, almost, I mean, it's it, it's a kind of writing one doesn't encounter in our end very much, but this meditation on suicide um, that happens in the in the in in this essay um, on what she calls the unpopular fact of suicide, right? The large number of her friends refugee friends who embrace this quote quiet and modest way of vanishing um you know she talks about that the only time when she was in gores in camp when suicide was mentioned when was when some people um suggested a group collective suicide as a kind of protest she said but that talk ended quickly when people reminded them they had been brought here to be killed and then to kill themselves would sort of be um not much of a protest. Um, I'm re I, it, this, reading this made me think a lot about Sebastian Junger's work. I don't know how many of you read Sebastian Junger, um, his book Tribes. Um, but one of the things that he talks about in that book is numerous, numerous studies that show that there's almost no incidence of depression or mental illness in people who are fighting for survival in amongst catastrophes in war and it's only in you know in in the relative comfort after a war or or in, in bourgeois society that rates of mental illness really go up in the modern era and um uh, it does strike me that um there's something similar to that going on in the sort of in rn's writing about refugees you know in New York and Paris in the 1930s and 40s. Um, uh, not all refugees, in her telling, obviously, commit suicide. Um, the other main way to um, uh, avoid the, the painful uh, depression, the, the painful dehumanizing uh, aspect of being a refugee is assimilation. Um, and assimilation, uh, as we've talked a lot about, and we'll talk more about in reading this book, is something she's very skeptical of. She says it's a way of denying who one is. A refugee wants, above all, to blend in with this new country. And in doing so, she says, quote, we re reveal nothing but our insane desire to be changed, not to be Jews. Right. So assimilation is a way of responding to being a refugee that denies who we are as Jews, as she tells it. Lacking the courage to fight for a change of our social and legal status, 
we have decided instead, so many of us, to try and change our identity. Thus, the refugee chooses the hopeless sadness of assimilationists over the political struggle to be accepted as who one is. And I just I'm gonna read this paragraph on Mr. Cohn that she puts into her um, text here. It's on page 271. It's again, it's one of these passages in this essay that once you read it, I think is very hard to get out of your head. Um, she says, just before it in the paragraph on beginning on 271, man is a social animal and life is not easy for him when social ties are cut off. Moral standards are much easier kept in the texture of a society. Very few individuals have the strength to conserve their own integrity if their social, political, and legal status is completely confused. So this is simply looking from the abstract down at society. Um, how we as a social animal are at a loss when as refugees, we are cut out of our social world. And then she writes, someday somebody will write the true story of this Jewish emigration from Germany. And he will have to start with a description of that Mr. Cohn from Berlin, who had always been 150% German, a German super patriot. In 1933, that Mr. Cohn found refuge in Prague, right? And not, just remember, in 1933, Hannah Arendt found refuge going through Czechoslovakia on her way to Paris. Found refuge in Prague and very quickly became a convinced Czech patriot, as true and as loyal a Czech patriot as he had been a German one. Time went on. And about 1937, the Czech government, already some under Nazi pressure, began to expel its Jewish refugees, disregarding the fact that they felt so strongly as prospective Czech citizens. Our Mr. Cohen then went to Vienna to adjust oneself there. A definite Austrian patriotism was required. The German invasion forced Mr. Cohen out of that country. He arrived in Paris at a bad moment, and he never did receive a regular residence permit. Having already acquired a great skill in wishful thinking, he refused to take mere administrative measures seriously, convinced that he would spend his future life in France. Therefore, he prepared his adjustment to the French nation by identifying himself with our ancestor, Vesin Tugatois, I don't know. I think I had better not dilate on the further adventures of Mr. Cohn, as long as Mr. Cohn can't, can't make up his mind to be what he actually is, a Jew, Nobody can foretell all the mad changes he will still have to go through. I mean, you can see in this the pain Arendt finds in assimilation. Um, in the attempt to be not who you are, right? To, to give up who you are and assimilate into, um, into uh, another people, another country. And the refugee as this deadened, pitiful person in need of pity and help is someone who is in a sense um, forced into the choice of suicide. And, 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 and there's just different elements of suicide, but suicide, part of suicide is losing your Jewishness, losing who you are, but also literal suicide um, or the hopeless sadness of assimilation as she calls it. Um, which is to adjust in principle to everything and everybody on page 272. Um, she says in the end that basically there's these choices, right? That you have as a, as a refugee. Um, uh, most of them refuse to keep their identity. She calls it a mania for refusing to keep their identity on page 273. She says the desperate, confusion of these Ulysses wanderers who, unlike their great prototype, Ulysses, right, don't know who they are, is easily explained by their perfect mania for refusing to keep their identity. Um, she then really sets up this opposition, right, between suicide and assimilation um, as two paths of the least resistance um, by which the refugee seeks to fit in. But she then ends her essay by saying there's another path open to the refugee, a path that she says the very few among us, this is a quote, 
the very few among us who have tried to get along without all these tricks and jokes of adjustment and assimilation. These few refugees who insist upon telling the truth, even to the point of indecency, get in exchange for their unpopularity one priceless advantage. History is no longer a closed book to them, and politics is no longer the privilege of the Gentiles. What she means here is she's talking about what she calls a conscious pariah, one who consciously decides to stand outside of the society they're in, to not assimilate, and to embrace their outsider status. Um, to tell the truth as a refugee who is stateless, homeless, and rootless is to insist that the surrounding society take seriously the rise of a new and increasingly common kind of human being, a new kind of human beings that she's actually talking about. Um, the kind that are put in concentration camps by their foes and in internment camps by their friends. And so she offers at the end of this essay the hope that by telling the truth as refugees, it's possible that the German Jews in this case, but someone who does what they do, could become what she calls the avant-garde of a new politics, um, a politics uh, based on um, uh, those who dare to appear as who they are rather than disappearing through assimilation or suicide. Uh, she holds out the hope that the willingness to speak one's truth to appear in public as a refugee who is in risk of losing oneself allows the refugee to transform the political world and create a space for appearance in which the refugee can meaningfully acquire the right to be in public without having to assimilate and lose her identity. Um, I think this is what Arendt means by the chance to enter politics and history in telling the truth and to become um, a new avant-garde of European politics. Um, such a politics, she says, would need to move beyond our current politics, relying on nation states defined by the predominance of homogenous national identities. And it's in this new politics of the refugee, and the refugee is the vanguard of a new political form, that Arendt calls for refugees to speak and act in politics in this essay. So this is written in, in 1943. Um, seven years before Origins is published. Um, and I think what you've been reading for the last three months in this text of Jewish writings in some ways does, and I think in some ways doesn't yet prepare you for the sort of bombshell that this essay is. Um, you see her struggling through the last hunt, 270 pages that we've read so far in this text with trying to understand questions of assimilation, questions of if you're attacked as a Jew, defend yourself as a Jew, don't deny yourself as a Jew, questions of Jewish army, um, question of what would it be to have a Jewish politics, what would it mean to be um, to have a, a, a new political order not based on nation states where Jews are always um, a minority and uh, without power. Um, and so in many ways, a lot of the issues that she's talking about here in this essay um, are, are, are prefigured in what we've read. Certainly some of the anger is um, rage to go back to our um, conference of a few weeks ago. Um, but, and, but this idea of, of, of potential and, and, and the call for the Jews to be an avant-garde or for refugees to be an avant-garde, um, you know, again, I think fits with some of the claims that Jews have to enter politics. Uh, and yet um, uh, the forcefulness in which he identifies the refugee as a new type of human being, that's new. And where she claims that we need a new politics 
adequate to this new type of refugee and this new type of human being. I think that's new and that will um, come and play a large part in her uh, reading of, 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 of in, in book nine of Origins of Totalitarianism in her thinking about what a human is and what human rights are and the failure of human rights. Um, yeah, I mean, much of her argument about the failure of human rights, which treats humans simply as a mere human outside of any kind of political context, is, I think, first fully, first developed here in this essay, uh, We Refugees in 1943. Okay, um, there's a lot in this essay. There's some other things we read for today. I, I'm just going to focus mostly on this essay, but if you have questions about other things, I'm happy to talk to you about them. Um, I think there were some very interesting parts in the other essays we read for today, but this is to me the the one to, to focus on for now. Uh, please, in the chat, uh, engage the ideas. Be respectful of your fellow uh, participants. Um, and happy to engage in a conversation. If you want to raise your hand, go down to the reactions button uh, and click raise hand. And we will begin with Hannah. Need to unmute yourself, Hannah. Hi, I did miss probably the first few minutes of your explanation, which I hate to do. So um, I, if I repeat it, I'm sorry, but I was just so blown away by We Refugees. It's a magnificent piece of writing. And, you know, as somebody who teaches writing, I think it should be like, except that it's very difficult, but it, you know, for young kids to maybe, although I don't know, maybe they would really relate to it with the South America and with our immigration crisis, but the language that she used from, from just from a rhetorical perspective, the language that she used, one of irony and bitterness, yeah. um, and the types of rhetorical devices that she used, which is contrast and juxtaposition um, of, you know, she, the bitterness is like our saviors, you know, the words and the concrete language, um, you know, she goes like, hell is no longer religious belief or fantasy, but something as real as houses and stones and trees. And it makes you think of The Dark Hour by Roosevelt, where he uses a concrete, uh, you know, where he modifies a noun with to make it concrete. So the genius of the writing uh, really uh, blew me away um, throughout. Um, also, what I found, and she's mentioned this elsewhere, but basically saying that the worst status you can have today is that of a mere human being. That's the worst status, you know? And that is so relevant today that it's crazy, uh, especially with, you know, and then I don't know if she said it here, but in some of the other essays, which I read because I couldn't the other time, where she talks about, um, uh, well, I just wanted to mention that I thought the way toward the reconciliations of, pe of peoples was an incredibly also very powerful essay uh, full of justifications for a Jewish state, which of course, you know, is interesting because she went through so many permutations about Zionism and now, um, you know, it's very uh, anti-Zionism among especially Jewish studies people is very, very uh, ascendant. And um, so it's just very interesting, you know, in the, this article, A Way Toward the Reconciliations of People, where she basically provides a complete rationale for the Jewish state. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, uh, no solution to national problems without a nation or national soil, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that she's offered other very important caveats to that, of course. Um, but anyway, uh, I just, you know, this We Refugees was, you know, mind blowing. And uh, I, but I did want to point out the rhetorical genius that I found in it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Um, I think it's, it is worth pointing out. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, piece of writing. And it's, it a power, it's a powerful piece of writing. I mean, the, the 
you know, there's certain, you know, you mentioned some things, the, 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 the repeated return to the idea of optimism, right, throughout the piece in an obviously ironic way. And yet, um, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, some people have, I, I, one of the things that when you read, when you teach a lot of Hunter N and read a lot of, you know, some people say, oh my God, she writes so beautifully. And other people like, she writes so terribly. I mean, she writes. This is genius. This, this, this is a different piece of writing. It's not like a lot of her other pieces. Uh, there are parts of Eichmann and Jerusalem that I think are like this too. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not an accident um, that it's when she's writing about, uh, about her, her, her status as a refugee or, or, or as a Jew. Um, yeah, um, some of what you mentioned, I think is right. The, the idea that hell has been realized that it's no longer an idea, um, is, is, it was, is something I, I do remember well, her use of Yiddish here, um, not something we see very often. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for pointing all that out. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that and, and and go on. Um, George. Uh, again, uh, I, I won't argue about the literary merit of this essay, but uh, it's one of the few places where I found uh, Heine Arendt to be melodramatic uh, in the sense that she mentions just two opposites. Either you're Jewish or you're assimilated. Now, uh, I think it was Arthur Sandauer. Anyway, it was a uh, a Polish intellectual Jew who coined the terms acculturate, which she never uses. And I guess that's a characteristic of German Jewish writers, or many of them. They don't uh, uh, realize that there is such a, a, a thing as being in a culture the Jew, which I think that many of us in America are. Uh, nowadays, that is, you, you're Jewish, you celebrate Jewish holidays, you, uh, you're religious to a varying extent, but you're acculturated to the extent that you're allowed to be acculturated in a particular society. And, uh, you know, again, uh, the Polish refugees that I know, and we love to call each other refugees because otherwise it becomes either DPs or greenhorns or greeners, which are the other words that are being used. And uh, certainly they, 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 there's really no, uh, in, in those people, there's there's no uh, uh, negativity to that particular word. So I think this this is particular to a certain aspect of of geographical Judaism that the German Jews and uh, uh, and it doesn't hold all across. So I uh, I just wanted to mention that aspect. Of it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I I I think. Um... So there is a kind of starkness to their this essay, which is maybe what um, something along the lines of that made it, you know, so um, powerful. And and one wonders, or one can wonder, as you do, George, right? Um, to what extent that starkness is justified? Is there really just this choice between assimilation and suicide? Um, uh, you know, and 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 obviously, there's not right. Uh, first of all, she brings in a third avenue, which is the conscious pariah. Uh, but there are obviously always going to be nuances, and mm -hmm. and and so we can ask, and I think should ask, to what extent she, you know, ignores that nuance. Um, I think she's she's speaking. I mean, one of the big questions that I've found myself getting involved in when I talk about this essay with other folks is who's the audience of this essay, right? Um, you know, it was written in a Jewish journal, Menorah. Um, you know, not sure exactly what that means, you know, but who's the audience? Is she speaking to other refugees? Is she speaking to Jews? Is she speaking to, to Gentiles? Um, you know, what what's what's she trying to do um i think she's talking about a particular group of people refugees remember 1943 new york jewish refugees not only are you being followed on the subway and being suspicious in shops like she's talking about right um uh not only are you being 
in, you know, submit, you know, uh, seen as suspicious, but your friends are dying in camps, right? You've lost your family. You've lost your thing. I mean, she's, she is writing from somewhat of a period of crisis. And I think we have to be aware of that. Um, and, uh, I think some of us, me, myself included, have a tendency to think of our aunt as this sort of disembodied brain at times, you know? Um, and this is not a disembodied piece of writing. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned acculturated Jews or acculturation as opposed to, to, to assimilation. Um, and I think that's clearly true and it's a reality and it's important. And um, I don't think she would disagree with that. But this is written at a time when she feels that she and other Jews are being attacked as Jews. They're being killed as Jews. They're being discriminated against as Jews. And at that kind of a period, um, acculturation is harder. I think it's a different scenario. Maybe, but 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 that's just, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't have a I mean, I think you're right that it is stark, but uh that's how I understand it. Uh, Monica. Hi, uh, thanks for taking this question. Um, my question is related to some comments she made in the essay about reconciliation, um, which had me wondering a bit. She, um, she comments that, you know, with the progress of the war, that even those who had allied themselves with their states in the anti-Semitism and the shameful destruction of Jews found that eventually they themselves were not protected and were and became under attack. And in a sense, sort of joined this refugee-like status um, by becoming alien from their states and sort of like it, in a sense it made me think like they also became kind of you know non-citizens um and then based upon that she thought a, a possibility for reconciliation would be and she quotes and i'm not sure the page because i'm on kindle but <clears throat> you know there's a possibility for a reconciliation um and for jews to join politics and enter and fight for justice and equality with non-Jews. And she says, this war is a war of the common man, as Henry Wallace, the vice president has, of America has put it. Um, and, you know, I just found that sort of interesting, this appeal to other non-Jewish but citizens as also alienated from their state and in a sense understanding this need to ally with the with the Jewish population for the shame of what they had committed under their states and sort of alienated from their states too and I wonder like you know I think there's a lot of you know as you say it's difficult to commiserate with refugees it's difficult to commiserate with disadvantaged people because we view them with pity we don't feel a solidarity with them and here she's bringing these citizens you know people who would enjoy the rights of common citizenship into that same group of refugees and i wonder does that seem realistic it, is it you know depending on this crisis point of the war where it had caused so much destruction and so many people were in a sense also joining in that refugee feeling and if that kind of solidarity can last and if it can actually become a, you know a viable political movement because it seemed to me like you know this was the possibility for something new you know she's just defining something new as people um creating something new out of this sort of alienation from the state something new something better and i just was wondering what your thoughts were on that thank you monica um yeah, I mean, this this essay, a uh, way towards the reconciliation of peoples, is a is a strange essay to me. Um, first of all, I have no idea. I mean, if anyone knows the history of this journal she published it in, in Buenos Aires, 
I mean, why was she publishing in Buenos Aires in 1942? I have no idea. Um, but so it goes. Um, and if anyone knows the history of that journal, uh, I'd love to to hear about it. Um, or why she published it in Buenos Aires. Um, you know, uh, it's... You know, the, the first one of the first things you said is, you know, where she's comparing citizens of other countries to the Jews. I mean, I think the argument here is that to the extent that other countries um, embraced anti-Semitism as a way of um, protecting themselves, it didn't work because the Germans poured over their borders anyway. And they lost their existence as nation states to the Germans even with their anti-Semitism. Um, and so she's simply saying that the the problem of um um the problem of 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 Europe of a European commonwealth of nations um uh is is one that has never been solved and won't be solved until the weakest link in it, namely the Jews, um are given a nation. And, and and it is solved. Um, you know, I, so much of Arendt's writing on this question is 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 um, aware of the counter danger of what happens when you then displace the Palestinians or the um, the Arab population of Palestine. This essay is not. Right. Um, and that they don't really come up here in this essay. So, um, again, hard to know exactly what to make of that. Um, but what she what I found. What I found fascinating about this essay is the way it connects with the essay that um, we also read today called um, Jewish politics. Um, where she says something that I think is fascinating on page uh, 241 which is that the only political ideas an oppressed people can have are freedom and justice. And democracy can be their only form of organization. Um, if you're an oppressed people, you can claim freedom, you can claim justice, and you can organize through democracy. And then she says, one of the most serious impediments to Jewish and not just Jewish politics is the fact that in our current intellectual world, those ideals that form and that form of organization, so freedom, justice, and democracy, have been corrupted and dragged through the mud by an uprooted bohemianism. Um, uh, that there's a, a kind of worship of cunning, of opportunism and propaganda, such that oppressed peoples are willing to do anything to get advantage and give up on the abstract ideals of justice, freedom, and democracy. And she says, this is a kind of real politique and its central figures are the businessman who winds up being a politician, convinced that politics is just a huge oversized business deal with huge oversized wins and losses. And the gangster who declares, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver. Hard to not read that today with a, different sense than it was written in 1942. Um, but uh, this claim for idealism, which is what she's making, right, for, for, for freedom and, and justice, um, comes back in this essay, um, uh, A Way Towards Reconciliation of Peoples, where on 259 at the bottom, she says, by now the tables have been turned. The Nazis who thought they had discovered that terror is the most effective means of propaganda have managed very much against their own will to teach these peoples anew the concepts on which all politics are based, freedom and justice, in a sense, as a reaction to the Nazis. Um, and, um, and then she goes along that. And so, I mean, I think she's hoping in this essay for a resurrection of freedom and justice and democracy as a way of reconciliation, as a way of pointing towards a new ideal. 
Um, and what she's saying is the the fact is that the complete oppression of the Jews has led to a moment in which there's a willingness of other peoples to help the Jews. Um, and, and we Jews have to take advantage of that. Um, that's what, you know, she's saying, and we have to seek solidarity with these other peoples, but she says, we can't ask for mercy. We can't ask to be given it. We want it. We have to instead ask to be allowed to fight for our freedom and our, justice and our democracy and, and that's that's her, her argument here um yeah i i don't it, that that essay was interesting but also I, I found a lot of it confusing to be honest but um but uh there are some interesting parts was there anything that i that you wanted to add, add again monica uh, no, I mean that, that, that. I also found it a little bit confusing, and I, I, I like your, I, I like the way that you coined that. It's really, you know, I had interpreted it as an appeal for something broader than just solving, you know, this question of, you know, protecting the Jews by allowing them to have a legitimate political entity. I was interpreting it as, you know, appealing as well to, to the to other nations who had now also experienced suffering under what had become authoritarian states in concert with the Nazis and perpetrating these, you know, terrible atrocities. And that maybe, you know, in addition to a Jewish state that there could be some sort of improvement towards liberty and equality in other nations, you know, that, that she was appealing, but, I, but she didn't really expound much on that, but I was just, I, I like that idealist event. So, but yeah, it, maybe it's just more limited in scope to just simply advocating for a Jewish state. So that clarifies. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Susan. Yeah. Hi, Roger. Hi. Um, so I, I really enjoyed, I've enjoyed reading all of these writings because I think one of the things I've struggled with, with Arendt is her idea of identity, identity. And in these writings, more than anywhere else, at least for me, I, I see this theme of identity over and over again. It, it expressed, of course, mostly, I think, in the Jew, as a terms of a Jewish identity. And I wondered, just in continuing to think about her idea of identity, I, I just wish we could maybe drill down on that a little bit and what she connects that to, um, you know, citizenship, shared history, shared suffering, shared uh, prejudice, you know, I, I don't know. These are all the questions that I have. And I, and, and I think about it because it seems to me, especially, well, I shouldn't say especially, the time in which I live, but it seems to me there are there's so many identities today. And maybe I am confusing the identities of today in terms of the identities of all of the minority groups you know, LGBT, I mean, all of the groups that have their own identity. And I'm trying to see if there is a correlation somehow in her thoughts of identity with what we've seen, what we're seeing today, which is an ex extraordinary number of what I call identities that people identify themselves with. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. You can help me kind of work through that a little bit. Thanks, Susan. Um, so, I mean, I, I think identity is an enormously rich and complex pot. And yeah. any one of us at any given time probably has at least dozens of identities. Um, right? And part of being a human being is having all those identities and being able to live richly from each one of them at the moments when you want to, I think. Um, uh, part of the problem with being, being a refugee is that it becomes an imposed identity on you um, that deadens all the others. And that requires you to, um, uh, in a sense, um, reject who you are uh 
at least part of your identity in order to uh, assimilate. Um, similarly, if you're attacked based on one of your identities, whether, whatever it is, being a Jew or, 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 or based on your race or, or religion or, or ethnicity, um, you're then put in a position of either denying that, which you probably can't do, or embracing it and defending it in a way that overemphasizes it, right? If you're that overemphasizes it, yeah. Yeah, if yeah. you're attacked as a Jew, defend yourself as a Jew. Right. I mean, right. Aren't, you know, didn't want to see herself as a Jew in every aspect of her life. Exactly. And yet <laughs> there are times when, I mean, what's interesting to read these essays from the late, from the early 1940s is it's a time in which she clearly um, felt that it would be almost untrue to herself to not embrace her Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and one has, in, in a sense, it would be, it would be, un, I don't know, unethical. It would be, but it would certainly be untrue to herself, I think. Uh, um, and, and so you have to do that. And, and she finds that also offensive to be forced mm. to be into that position right mm. to be forced to say i'm a jew above all you know that's not who she is and yet she has to mm. say that and she feels the political need to say that um and and so she's she's um upset about that so you know all of these are are parts of um you know her her, her work here the you know, the end where she talks about these few like Bernard Lazar and um, Heinrich Heine and Rahel Varnhagen and Shalom Alechem and Franz Kafka or even Charlie Chaplin, she mentions all this on 274, are people for whom she says, um, uh, um, they offer a hidden tradition, right, of the conscious pariah, um, where you can um, seek to remain a Jew uh, and yet uh, stand outside of society, not try and get ahead, not um, not try and um, become a parvenu, as, as you call it. Um, and and in, in doing so, you can look around and see things in a truthful way. And if you do start telling the truth, even to the point of indecency, um, you get this advantage that you enter politics, you enter history, yeah. you become yeah. someone who um, who acts on the world stage. Um, and she says, refugees driven from country to country represent the vanguard of their peoples if they keep their identity, right? Now, you know, that there's a cost to that, right? She's saying, look, there is a cost to that. Namely, you have to identify as a Jew and a refugee, which mm -hmm. is more, and you're more than that. But you also get the advantage that for the first time you become political and you have a, a chance to, to right. enter the political stage. Because that's what she, that's exactly right. Just, that's a great ending for, to my question, because it seems to me that she is calling for or says that politics can indeed be built around a shared identity of people, or is that you think stretching her point too far? Well, I think politics can be built around. I mean, I, I mean, it is it is being built around it today. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, it certainly can. Um, but she thinks that there's a cost to that. No, oh, okay. But there's also a benefit to it. And, and the she, cost is in the extremism? The cost is the extremism the of who you are? Yeah, the cost is that you yeah. become a, a flattened individual. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Okay. Because none of us are represented by simply one identity. Yeah. And, and in, she's saying for the political good of Jews, in this case, or and refugees, some people are going to have to embrace their identity their, their identity as a refugee and go for it and enter politics in that. And they're going to pay for it in their humanity, mm -hmm. but they're going mm -hmm. to 
they're going to have political they're going to enter politics and they're going to have they're going to do things that will enable other people to live better lives good thank thank you that does help yep. appreciate it okay. Arkhavan, how are you? Hi, Roger. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. So I really enjoyed this essay. I think most, more than any other writing of the, uh, Hannah Arendt. Uh, because for me, I understood like the others coming from her brain and analyzing and trying to understand politics and what's going on, what and what Jews have to do. This one is more coming from her heart and like raw emotions from a person who has very uh, high self-awareness about uh, what's um, like happening inside him as a refugee. And I like that, how she described that. So for me, there's two pieces that's very important. One of them is like trying to build in capacity for people that they read this piece about cultural competency, we call it these days, cultural competency in the organizations that works with refugees and for the people that they never been refugee to understand what it means to be a refugee, to understand how to call them, how to pronounce their uh, country's name, their, uh, the things that is impor important, pieces of their identity that's important for them. I don't know who is the audience, but I think it can be anyone. And part of this is self like building or trying to build in self-awareness for, for Jewish people themselves that I say, that's what we are. That's the other layer of the identity. But then in some parts, when we feel that there's like, she's exaggerating or going dark, for me, that was really, really real. For someone that I am a, a, a newly become a citizen of the US and being refugee and how that changed my, my whole identity, adding that layer that I didn't like. And sometimes asking me to talk about my story, what it means to be a refugee, or that means talk about all the miserable things that happened to you. And that's not easy. That's that's sometimes stimulating because even if you go through a lot, you don't want to talk about it. It is, it's kind of a thing happened to you and seeing you or, or, or just making that part of your identity that bold, it, it is irritating. And I understand how she just go that to there. And in the exact, there's like some darkness or exaggerating about suicide and this and that. I don't think it is, is exaggerating for me because it is like she has so many layers of identity that been removed from here or try to be removed or the whole world were against it. So removing that Jewishness and it comes with that another part of like working with refugee myself and being a refugee. There's another part of being a refugee that you always have holding type of guilt about why you are being saved and others are still there dying or going through that difficulties. So you see some part of that too in that, say like being saved or being alive is the ultimate goal. So I just wanted to share that as a refugee person. And I really, really, I, I just loved her more because I, I haven't read this piece before. Thank you so much for your explanation about it. Thank you, Akbar. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think this piece does this essay beautifully written as we started with. Um, really does capture the way an identity like a refugee identity can be deadening, and um, and you know, um, and I think you spoke beautifully about that and how it's not something people want to talk about. Right. I think that's what you said. And and that's what she was saying is, you know, no one wants to talk about it. That's why they deny it. And they did say they run away from it and they try and assimilate. And um, it's it's such a deadening identity. Um, and yet she's I mean, this is the sort of. Turn some of us are going to talk about it and we're going to make it political and we're going to do what other people don't want to do, which is talk about this way that the, 
the rise of refugees matters in our political world. And, um, and you know, that's what she really does in the last paragraph here, but in chapter nine of Origins of Totalitarianism, where she, in a sense, takes up that challenge and argues that the, the politics of the future has to be a politics that does justice to refugees. Um, uh, that refugees become the, the problem because um, they become the prototypical figure of human rights. And insofar as they are, they show the danger of human rights, right? Which is that it turns us into mere human beings without a without a without a world without a history without a without a, a place to be meaningful in the world to just be kept alive and and she sees very clearly that danger um uh for 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 a world of increasing numbers of refugees so um thank you thank you uh vivian good to see you vivian Hi, thank you. Um, um, I, I so much appreciated uh, Akwan, uh, her remarks as I was waiting to, to respond um, to something, to that image of yours, um, Roger, that reminder that some people uh, might uh, forget um, the human being who's writing and think of somehow of Arendt as a disembodied uh, brain, which of course she isn't, and and I, I think I mean it's a really simple idea, but it's it's good to be, to to remind people of that because um because I think that happens a lot, and she, she's she's sort of, she's constantly sort of not uh, you know the term re-traumatized. It's as if she's re um, uh, re repunished. I think our end has been punished over and over again in so many in so many ways. The things that have, have a way of turning back on themselves. But but what 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 I wanted to say was that um, I think also that just her own um, German culture of I don't know what word to use other than stoicism. This sort of uh, the the German equivalent of stiff upper lip. Uh, which uh, which holds her together in a lot of ways because she's obviously as a uh, she because she's so steeped in in German culture she's more German than the Germans in so many ways and for this also she gets punished and repunished for so I wanted to to say that in terms of understanding where she's coming from even though he was a Polish Jew and even though there is that. A fundamental difference between that sort of culture of uh, stiff upper lip and, and stoicism and not talking about your weaknesses uh, in, in, in the German culture as opposed to Polish culture, which is completely different. So I think that there's just no one who writes, I'm talking fiction here, writes about the um, refugee experience in that time that Arendt was writing here localized that in New York City than um, Isaac Beshever's singer and in a couple of his short stories. And I, I'm sorry, but I don't remember the titles, but they're, they're typically um, the, uh, written in uh, diners or you know, inexpensive restaurants where these people ate and congregated. And nothing, nothing else um, um, evokes and and explores and sort of mines and probes the, the alienation, the displacement of these people, the pain of the displacement, the loneliness, the suicidal uh, uh, ways and thoughts, and the 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 depression and uh, just the 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 rank displacement and loneliness of the refugee experience in in so many ways. I mean. Um, and not to sort of over emotionalize it. I, I think that all of that is included when you when you when you think of what it means to be a displaced person. And and I want to say that that experience has nothing to do with other people's ideas of privilege or disadvantage uh, in general and specifically in the uh, 
uh, experience of being a refugee, because the, those ideas have nothing to do have nothing to do with it, because it, they don't address what it means to be displaced and the particular um, fractured view of the world that that is um, a result, and then sort of forms you for the rest of your life wherever you may be, no matter how so-called assimilated, which is a ridiculous idea really, uh, you, you may be or how successful in the world you may or may not be. Oh, thank you, Vivian. Oh, thank you, Vivian. Oh, oh. Uh, can you just can mute, you just so mute? echo? Someone needs to mute themselves. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think everything you said is right on. Um, It's a hard essay to talk about for this reason. It's like, you know, it almost silences us to some degree. Um, uh, the fracturing and the displacedness of it, you know, I think is is part of what she's given voice to. I mean, I, I noticed, I noticed that... Um, well, I mean, George in his question sort of pushed back against this, right? And then also Bob Meyerson in the first question in the chat I was just looking at asks similarly, you know, how did RN start in life if not as an assimilated German, right? And what does she become if not an assimilated American citizen? And she wasn't a religious Jew. Um, I'm sorry. She, I'm sorry. She was never an assimilated German. She was German to the core, but she was she was a Jew. She was not. It, the, it, the, the 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 deeper you probe into that strange idea of assimilated German, the the more you will discover that it 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 is an absurd idea. It doesn't it, it can't exist really. I, I think I, I think you're I think right. Think and you know I think she. I think she probably, I mean certainly by the by the time she left Germany, she was very clear that she could never be a German, right? Um, uh, I think there was a lot of, there were a lot of people who, a lot of Jews in Germany who thought they were assimilated Jews and they found assimilated Germans and they found very quickly that they weren't. And, you know, she has some very interesting uh, letters between her and Carl Jaspers where she basically says, you know, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I was, you know, we can't be Germans. Um, she thought Jews could be Americans because she thought that to be an American didn't mean giving up being a Jew in a way that being a German meant giving up a Jew. Um, being a Jew. And, and so she, you know, there's a, I think she probably has, or at least had at some point, higher hopes for that possibility. Um, I think, uh, if I understand her correctly. Um, but here, you know, I think in the 1940s, she's really writing from this, um, from out of this sort of sense of, 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 of anger and rage, I think. Uh, at um, at having to be a refugee, having to be a a displaced, lost person in some way. And yet, what's amazing to me about this essay, really, the most amazing thing is her willingness to, in some sense, embrace that as a political, um, as a political, or her call for that to be embraced as a political act. She did remember in the very beginning uh, when we were reading the uh, the eight essays, the uh, Beyond Past and Future. I um, I think I think it was then, or maybe even before. You you emphasized uh, her new beginnings, her notion of new beginnings, and everything. It's as if her anger is because when you're displaced, it's ground zero. You have to begin again. And there's a very dark and sad and lasting cost to that, which is that what you lose forever is familiarity. Mm -hmm. And that's something mm -hmm. that can't be replaced. And one thing is 
because it has to do with time and lived and grown experience. So new beginnings is all very well and good and, and, and it's wonderful because it also makes uh, any uh, creative person what they are and in her case writing and the ideas that she didn't have before that she has because of this, uh, this uh, painful experience. But, um, but, but you, you, you have to start again. I mean, anyone who's ever lived um, and thought they were going to be living forever in a place where they're speaking another language, and I know there are a bunch of people in this group where that's the case, try, try making jokes. Even if you're fluent in that language, after a couple of years, try making jokes, and then, and then you'll know exactly how much part of uh, that place and culture you are or not. It's, um, you know, <clears throat> it's almost like making jokes would be the measure of things, how comfortable or how, how, how fluent you are in, in a language in the broader sense. So, so she, she, made, she made a thing of that ground zero, that losing ground, that in, in, um, in um, valorizing, uh, you know, new ideas, new beginnings, I think. She did. I'm not saying I think that's good or convincing, but I know that she did do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I see we're back to people who've already spoken, which is great. Are there other people who want to say things that haven't spoken? All right, George, you're up, you're up next. Uh, you have to unmute. Yeah, just briefly, again, to go back to my point, where in, in Poland, other Eastern European countries, what we're talking about, uh, that a rent type Jews in Germany, we would call really acculturated rather than assimilated. And uh, the same thing in America. And just one thing sort of, again, to get back to specifics, I think with her essay, why it was published in, in, a, in, a, in an unknown German, uh, in an unknown journal, I, I believe that that was around the time, 43, where uh, Aufbau, where she usually used to publish, was getting, uh, uh, was getting negative feedback from the American press. That was getting a little too uncomfortable for, people, for, for papers like the New York Times to, to have that kind of uh, writing uh, about Jews. And I think Aufbau was trying to, 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 uh, to really to become a little more measured. And this kept on going back and forth. But in 1946, when I started reading Aufbau, uh, it was back to, uh, to being full blown against the Holocaust, et cetera. So there were American politics going on here too. It's possible. I mean, I mean, she kept writing an outbow for another couple of years, so it wasn't that she stopped. Um, I think they actually had a special s issue on this or something, but I'm not 100 percent sure. They um, did, but they varied on and off during during the uh, wartime, depending right. on how the Americans, uh, non-Jewish press, reacted to them. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hannah. Just a couple things that were going in my mind when you talked about who's the audience. And um, it does strike me very strongly that it certainly wasn't Orthodox Jews. Because <laughs> when you think about, or, you know, it was, it was secular Jews like Hannah Arendt. Because when you think about Orthodox Jews and like the, the many Satmar and all these sects that, that are here now and that came, as remnants, you know, they've they've chosen a path of complete separation. Um, and I don't think they had the sort of parvenu um, uh, uh, pariah uh, dichotomy, uh, either or thing identity, so much as the acculturated uh, secularized Jew. Uh, and it really strikes me very strongly that 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 that, that, that whole, you know, uh, schema for you, the refugee was for a certain, well, I mean, no, it was for everybody. My mother came when she was 12, 
May 10th, 1940, the day the Nazis invaded Holland. And she never recovered because of all those things that Vivian spoke about so eloquently. But in any event, the other thing I wanted to mention, you had just wondered why Buenos Aires. And I do remember that my grandfather, you know, when he was still in Holland because he never left and then he was put into Sobibor, uh, he said he was an old man and they wouldn't do anything to him. And then they did. But he used to write letters to Buenos Aires because it was a huge tobacco trading. Um, it was second only to what was the other, it was one that does three quarters of all tobacco. And then it was followed by Argentina, um, by um, Argentina, Buenos Aires. But the point is, is that there was so many refugees, so many people went to, Jews went to Buenos Aires who were German or Dutch, that maybe there was just a big publications there, pretty sizable audience because of that, I just thought I'd as kind of a historical interest. But I, I, I wondered if you'd agree about the Orthodox uh, not kind of fitting into the parvenu pariah, or I don't know. I guess we haven't really talked about that yet. That's coming up next. Yeah, no, I, I don't think she's talking about the Orthodox. I mean, <laughs> okay. um, um, yeah, um, that would be, you know, that's a, I mean, she's she's obviously talking about for parvenus and pariahs she's talking about people who parvenus who want to assimilate and 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 make their name in in the society and pariahs can well the orthodox would be closer to the pariah peoples in the sense that they keep themselves apart and and uh be who they are and be who they are and then get um but not in a conscious way, just because that's right. They're traditional. They are, and and they're and they're and they're oppressed. Um, so um, you know, the Eastern European Jews are often the pariah. Um, yeah. Um, so yes. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Lee. Uh, Lee, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Everybody does. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming back to Arendt's discussion of uh, suicide, uh, she's talking about uh, uh, people she knows who uh, 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 are uh, faced with uh, bad luck or other circumstances, almost determined uh, to uh, uh, carry out that act. Uh, uh, Arendt uh, seems to want to say that uh, uh, we are not we are not determined. We are. And of, and of course, we are free. And the line uh, uh, that she uses on page it's on page two sixty eight, uh, toward the middle of the page, uh, she says, "Perhaps the uh, philosophers are right, who teach that suicide is the best and supreme guarantee of human freedom." Uh, that's a uh, a theme that uh, comes out of uh, uh, existentialist. Uh, particularly uh, atheistic ex existentialist thinkers whom Rent was uh, acquainted with uh, during her uh, her stay in uh, uh, stay in Paris. Uh, but I, I uh, in arguing against uh, deterministic views of human action, uh, that is a uh, that's not an argument, uh, but it, it's it's something that uh, people sense intuitively. And the example I've used. Uh, uh, in, uh, to try and get this point across to uh, in, in a class is to uh, imagine yourself uh, 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 taking a hike and uh, you're uh, on top of a mountain and you're standing uh, three or four feet from the edge and that with a drop off of uh, a thousand feet or so. Uh, if you start, if you take one small step or two small steps towards the edge, uh, you have this uh, interior sense, okay, that you are f free or not to free to go over the edge, okay? And uh, uh, I think that's what, uh, 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 it, it, that brings uh, home to you this notion that yes, we are free to, uh, uh, to commit suicide or not to commit suicide. And uh, I think she brings that point into uh, uh, 
in, uh, effectively in, in her discussion. Yeah, that's a great metaphor, Lee. Thank you. I think it's, it's you know, this goes also back to the last question, Hannah's question about religious and non-religious Jews or Orthodox and non-Orthodox. She says, we are the first non-religious Jews persecuted, right? This is a, an important point for her. Um, uh, and we are the first ones who not only in extremists answer with suicide. Um, so it's, you know, if, if you're persecuted for being a religious Jew, it could be a religious persecution, but these persecutions are not religious, right? They're something else. And then she says, perhaps the philosophers are right who teach that suicide is the best and supreme guarantee of human freedom not being free to create our lives or the world in which we live, we nevertheless are free to throw life away and to leave the world. I'm not sure how seriously we're supposed to take that. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's a certain irony here in, in her writing where she doesn't think these philosophers are, are to be listened to that much. Um, but in any case, the suicide she's talking about, as she says in the next paragraph, are not mad rebels who hurl defiance at the world. Theirs is a quiet and modest way of vanishing. They seem to apologize for the violent solution they have found for their personal problems. Um, it's a kind of desperation and almost like I just can't take it. And so I'm going to walk, you know, I'm going to walk off the cliff as, as Lee was, was presenting it um, and just disappear. There's a kind of desperation involved in this. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I, you know, uh, what's, 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 I don't know how many people are in new who committed suicide. The one obvious figure who has to be in her mind is, is her good friend, Walter Benjamin, um, who committed suicide in, what, 1930? Um, I don't remember exactly yeah. what. I think 41. 40. 40. Yeah, or, uh, yeah it, it, it was the year the... Uh, that, that uh, Arendt was able to uh, uh, get on the boat to uh, to the United States. Right. So uh, yeah, so she, she wrote 41. a she, she writes a letter to Gershom Scholem in October of 1940, telling him about 1940. 1940, yeah. telling Scholem that um, that Benji had committed suicide. So he 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 must have committed suicide in in like the early fall or summer of 1940. Um, but this is the, I, I think what I'm, what I'm not sure about, right. Is to what extent Arendt is thinking fully of Benjamin in, in this essay on refugees or whether there's other people she has in mind. Um, for those who don't know, Benjamin was a, a good friend of Arendt's in Paris. I mean, newer in Germany, but became better friends in Paris. And um, was unable to get out, uh, and at the border between um, Spain and Portugal, in Port Bou on the Spanish border, committed suicide, um, and uh, Arendt was shaken, quite shaken by this. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, when she says our suicides are no mad rebels who hurl defiance, it's a quiet and modest way of vanishing. I just don't know to what extent she's talking about Benjamin. She's talking about other people. Um, you know, she talks on the next page about how I'm not going to give you numbers about suicides and said everyone wants to argue using numbers today. I'm not going to do that. She clearly has some examples in her head, but she doesn't write enough for me to I mean, if anyone else has any ideas on this, I'm, I don't know if any of her other friends committed suicide. Um, 
but uh bob thank you um as a footnote to the question of assimilation versus acculturation uh during world war one and this was uh well noted during the weimar period um jewish sh jewish soldiers uh suffered more casualties more deaths uh, than non-Jewish soldiers. So whether or not this was uh, conscripts who, you know, didn't weigh in on the question, uh, there were probably many uh, German patriots. So it was certainly possible, you know, before the rise of Nazism, uh, to be a German patriot, just as it is possible now to be an American patriot, you know, during the Trump administration or if and when Trump gets back into office. Um, now, the, the socialist take was, of course, the workers of the world, you know, should not fight this capitalist war. But that wasn't the case uh, in the vast majority of workers in, in Britain and Germany and France and probably elsewhere. Yeah, uh, 12,000 12, uh, Jewish soldiers fighting for Germany uh, died in World War I. And uh, uh, what's interesting, uh, Jewish soldiers who received the uh, German Iron, Iron Cross did not escape the uh, ravages of, uh, of Nazi rule in the 30s. Uh, right, but that, is... that, that was to come later. Yeah. We're... Yeah. Did you want to add something else, Bob? Or uh, no, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's that's all right. All I, yeah, I mean, I think there was there's no doubt there was German patriotism uh, amongst Jews and others. Um, I mean, our I mean, I think the point that someone was making, and I forget who was making it, and I I think that some at least for our end, at least when she was young, even though she was not religious um and even though she you know Jew Judaism was probably not a huge part of her upbringing um I don't think she would have ever called herself an assimilated G German or assimilated Jew in Germany because she always knew she was a Jew and took that seriously and she now this is partly a definitional thing and and maybe we go back to George's point about acculturation she thinks of assimilated Jews are those who deny their Jewishness. And when she says that it in Germany, in order to be a full German, you had to deny your Jewishness. You couldn't, you couldn't be both. She thought, I think in America, she could. And that was one of the reasons she was so um, taken with the United States when she first arrived. Um, you know, Roger, if I could just add a comment to that, someone we haven't mentioned is her uh, uh, former mentor and lover, uh, Heidegger, who was not Jewish. Um, he apparently had been in seminary at one point, yes? And, um, and so to, at the end, after he supposedly left the Nazi party, she help bring him to the States. And I find that to be a fascinating relationship. I guess there's no documentation as to what happened after he came to the States in terms of their relationship. So first, just a couple of facts, um, you know, uh, first of all, Heidegger, who's a very complicated figure, never actually left the Nazi party. He never resigned from the Nazi party. And secondly, he never came to the States. I don't know that, I don't know what oh. you're thinking of. I heard um, that she did help him come somewhere. He helped his right. writings become read here, um, but certainly not him personally. He never. Okay, thank you he, for he that. He never traveled here. Just to keep that straight, we got about two minutes left. Susan, you're you're you get the last word. Uh, well, this is really more of a question that actually comes from probably prior um, seminars, but um, this idea of Hannah Arendt, as I understood it, that the Jews needed a state in order to have power, in order to be political players. 
and to deal with um, minority oppression. So I've been thinking about like, to what extent has the state of Israel had any impact on anti-Semitism, let's say in the US or in France, or have African countries um, or the existence of African countries had an impact on racism in the US? And I wondered if anybody has any thoughts about that. That's a really big topic, and now I'll shut up. I'd love to talk <laughs> yeah, about it, but boy, that's a, question, yeah. that's a big topic. Sorry. There's a new book by Walter Russell Mead about anti-Semitism in U.S. foreign policy that's really excellent if you're interested in it. Um, just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, worth getting and reading. What's but, it called? Uh, it's called The Ark of the Covenant, I believe. Um, um yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. I don't have much more to say. I don't know how to answer that. But anyway, um, thank you all very much. Look, this is, a, this is a great essay. I hope you all enjoyed it. It seems like a lot of people did. Um, we're going to be reading next week, The Jewish Pariah, A Hidden Tradition. Um, I, I don't know if that's the whole reading or if there's others as well, but that, that will be uh, an exciting text. And I look forward to seeing you then. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt, and we'll see you next week.